But this week on Houston Newsmakers, the online loophole that legally puts weapons in the hands of Texans. A Channel 2 exclusive investigation shows Texans getting concealed handgun licenses through other states, and it's legal. But for how long? Investigates reporter Joel Eisenbaum is here with his investigation and State Senator John Whitmire with what he plans to do to stop it. Senator Whitmire, the chair of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, also with thoughts on the jail conditions in Harris and Waller counties, the mental health question about the accused killer of Deputy Darren Goforth, and much more. And April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. What you need to know to make a difference in the lives of the children in our community. From KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. And good morning and welcome to Houston Newsmakers. Earlier this week, Texas A&M announced concealed handguns would be allowed in all classrooms and college-owned dorms. The University of Texas has said concealed guns would be allowed in classrooms but not in dorms. Both are decisions related to what's called campus carry rules for Texas colleges to take effect in August. Most, if not all, private schools are opting out of that law that will be allowing those concealed handgun licenses, those who have those licenses, to carry those weapons on campus. Now, just how easy is it to get one of those licenses? Here this morning to talk about that question, St. Senator John Whitmire, the dean of the Texas Senate and chair of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, and Channel 2 Investigates reporter Joel Eisenbaum, whose exclusive report highlights what many believe is an unsettling way Texans are finding easy ways to get concealed handgun licenses. I'll talk to both of them in a couple of minutes, but first, here's a report by Joel Eisenbaum. Do you have reservations? Yes. No, we have reservations. As Channel 2 investigates recently revealed, it's easy to get a license to carry a gun in Texas. Conceal carry, open carry, whatever you prefer, it's the same license. And you can get one without following those pesky state of Texas qualification rules. But I don't think most legislators are aware of this. The trick is to skip the course designed for Texas residents, skip the 50 round shooting requirement, skip the review of our state's laws, and instead go for another state's easier to get license. You can get a Texas concealed hand, and you got Florida, it has different rules. Looser. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But since Texas accepts the gun licenses of 42 other states, you have other options. We took Florida's course right here in Texas at a buffet restaurant in Humble. Uh, sure, I'd take an Over four hours, we did less than 20 seconds of gun handling. But we did get a 35 minute sales pitch on insurance for when you do shoot someone. Hey, Mr. Medley. Hey, how you doing? How are you, sir? My name is Joel Eisenbaum. Hey, Channel Channel two. how are you? Russell Medley Sr. owns the company that teaches the class. Do you yes, think I these do. people I are do. ready to handle a weapon safely? Yes, they are. they are. But if that course just seems too long, too tough, too big of a hassle, Channel 2 Investigates has found an even easier option. A course you can take just about anywhere online. As you're firing the gun, you this can... time we're taking the Virginia course through a company called the Concealed Carry Institute. Our 20 bucks included a video on safety, nah. technique, and Virginia laws. I watched it, albeit with a few distractions over 90 minutes, and then took the multiple choice test. In less than two hours, I passed with nobody ever verifying I actually know how to handle a gun. We asked the owner of the website about that point. See, the problem that I have philosophically is once government starts telling you what, you, what the requirements are to exercise a manner of self-defense, they could require that everyone become an Olympic marksman. But that's not the way Texas State Senator John Whitmire sees it, who, after watching our undercover footage of the Florida class, promised to bring it up next legislative session. We have a model, and people are circumventing it, and it's dangerous. Every time I see that, I'm amazed at how easy it is. Were you, and now you said it was dangerous there, what can you do at this point to try to rally some support to try to get that loophole closed? Well, it is dangerous because it's way too easy. It circumvents the uh, standards at the state of Texas, which are not that extensive, you know, mm -hmm. 50 shots, four to six hours of classroom uh, review. But the reciprocity that we have with other states was never intended to circumvent our requirements. That was only to respect one of their citizens that might be visiting or crossing the state. No one intended, it's my belief, and I was there when we debated it, by the way, in 1995, I voted for concealed weapon permits. So this is not about whether you like to your support the Second Amendment. This is about public safety. 
and to allow people to go, as Joe did a great job of pointing out, and take a short course with no classroom or shots being fired, and then get to walk the streets of Texas in our communities with a concealed or a license to carry is wrong. We will have to revisit that in the legislature. And I believe I can build a consensus in Austin to say this is not what we intended. In fact, it actually makes a mockery of the Texas standards. How did you come across this story and were you surprised at the information you were gathering and getting as you were gathering? Well, yeah, when I heard the story originally, it was a tip. I think it came into our tip line and the lady said, I just took a course at a Golden Corral and I fired a gun inside a Golden Corral and I'm about to get my LTC. I said, that is impossible. There is no way that that happened. That first of all, you're firing a gun inside a restaurant that is open to the public. I couldn't believe it. And so we took the course. You are firing a gun in a sense, but as near as we can tell, it's a blank. You're firing into something that looks like a shoebox. But even so, that course was laced with so many other things besides um, what many experts believe you need to know in terms of expertise to get an LTC. I don't think many people would say it met our state standards in terms of what you should know. You were talking about trying to limit in some way, shape, or form the reciprocity kind of arrangement. Would it just be something as simple as saying unless those other states standards come up to the Texas standard that the reciprocity deal is off? In, in working uh, with my staff and suggesting how we draft legislation, I'm headed in the direction of saying you've got to at least meet the state of Texas standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to go to a gun range with an instructor and demonstrate that you can safely fire the gun. In the meantime... And, and know when to fire the gun that you pick up in a classroom. It sounds like you might even be interested in improving or raising the level of qualification for the state, for the state of Texas. Well, it may be too late to do that. Yeah, but. that would be difficult. And in, in, in fact, in recent sessions, we've lowered the classroom hours. Mm. Uh, so, you know, our current law has been well debated, uh, there's support for it in Austin, and uh, I would think we start out by saying we're not going to have out-of-state license granted by going around Texas standards. One of the other things associated with the open carry was now campus carry, which sure. gives the opportunity, and we talked about this earlier, that the state of Texas this, uh, public universities are not saying, for the most part, UT is saying only in the dorms can you not. A&M says, hey, you can have them. Are you concerned about safety issues as a result of that? I know you, you kind of sure. didn't particularly like this sure. particular part of it. Uh, I'm very much concerned about campus carry, uh, and I think we ought to leave it to the local campus presidents, the chancellors of the universities, working with their Department of Public Safety to determine what the standards ought to be. Now, as you stated, we're having a variation of standards from campus. A&M just said you can go in a residence hall with a gun. UT, no. But what really disturbs me is, is that we're forcing public universities to have campus carry. When I know the leadership and a lot of the students' bodies are opposed to it, but we gave the public university, uh, the private universities the right to opt out. Mm -hmm. And to this point, each and every one of them are doing it. So why within the same state, the same legislature, we allow and, I, and they argue it was a property rights uh, right. position, which I think is, is, is ridiculous because they get state monies. So we ought to have the same standards for public and private. And quite frankly, I think the local governance ought to be able to determine whether they have that program or not. Anything cooking in the investigates unit regarding campus carry? Well, we are looking into campus carry because it seems like there's sort of a mishmash of rules. You certainly have to know what you're going into when you go onto each campus because it's not going to be uniform across all campuses, that's for sure. Like two-year colleges found out recently, they're not even going to adopt this law or this rule for another year. So if you're going to a two-year, like you're going to Lone Star HCC, it doesn't kick in until 2017. A lot of people don't even know that. So a lot of information still out there. Joel, thank you very much uh, for your reporting on this exclusive story. And congratulations, by the way, on your Associated Press Award thank as you, uh, Best Reporter. In appreciate the state. that. We appreciate sir. that. Thank congratulations. You. Well deserved. Thank you. Senator Whitmire is going to stick around. We're going to talk about the state area jails and the people held within them and what can be done and more. That's next when Houston Newsmakers continues. And welcome back to Houston Newsmakers and State Senator John Whitmire. Senator, your office was shot at a few weeks ago. Any latest on the investigation into that? What's been determined? It appears it was random. Uh, Texas Rangers and Houston Police Department did outstanding jobs of 
a comprehensive review. Unfortunately, there were other buildings in the Heights that were shot about the same time frame. Mm -hmm. So they concluded, uh, maybe they wanted me to feel better, uh, but it was uh, determined to probably be random, but it'll get your attention. Oh, absolutely. And did some damage. It's amazing when a bullet goes through a wall, what it does when it exits the other side. I mean, it just blows the sheetrock and paintings and pictures off. Well, it does some serious damage. Well, we're glad no one was hurt, and we're glad that that's the result, and hopefully they'll be able to find out who did it. Hey, last week, a committee in Waller recommended changes to the, uh, the jail there in the wake of the Sandra Bland death. Among them, they uh, recommended a new jail. They recommended body cameras for staff screening of inmates for medical and mental health issues. They want them to not have EMTs, but have medical staff there. They want to ban derogatory language, among other things. What sure. were your thoughts about what you heard about the beginnings of what, at least those recommendations in Waller? They're sound uh, in terms of construction of new jail. Obviously, that'll be a local decision, mm -hmm. but it certainly speaks to the, the need to visit our county jails across the state. And in fact, my criminal justice committee was asked by the lieutenant governor to have these hearings across the state. And we're determining that we've got a lot of concerns about the conditions in jail, how you get in jail, particularly nonviolent, low-level offenders, certainly with mental health cases. We've got to do a better job. No one should be held in jail because they can't afford a bond right. on, a, on a misdemeanor. Like, we, is this tragedy we heard in Harris County just two days ago. He, he hadn't been convicted of anything, and he's in a holding cell with 20 other people charged with a misdemeanor, and he gets beaten to death. Uh, Miss Bland should have never still been incarcerated on the Sunday that she took her own life. You ought to, if you don't pose a public threat, get a PR bond if you can't afford the $500 in Miss Bland's case mm -hmm. to get out, go back to work, go to your home. Uh, Mr. Brown had been given a $3,000 bond. 10% of it he has to come up with the cash, $300. So it's not a public safety concern. Right. They've already determined they're good risk to be released, but it's a financial concern. And you think and it's wrong. It's going to hopefully get some change. We're working on it, and we've got to do a better evaluation of people when they come in the front door to get them in and get them out, let them come to court on their set date, and let them hold their job and, and their families. Got nonviolent, low level offenders. Got a couple of minutes left. I want to get your comments on the uh, Shannon Miles situation. Um, he's the accused killer, Deputy sure. Darren Goforth. Uh, was supposed to have been going to a state mental institution. Yeah. He's still at Harris County Jail. You wanted to expedite that. What was, what was the reason behind that? Well, the, the rationale behind it was the allegation that he took an officer's life, a very serious tragedy, and took the life of the people, the co-workers of the victim. And I just thought it was unhealthy based on the jail's conditions. Hey, any given day, it's not safe for anyone to be in a Harris County Jail. Mm -hmm. It's so overcrowded, uh, uncontrolled. Mr. Miles uh, has been determined to be incompetent. So I read about it, drinking my morning coffee and reading the paper, and determined that why would you put him in the environment of being protected and safeguarded by the friends and family members of the person that you allegedly took their life? You surprised I still, I still know it was the right thing to do, to move him to the front of the line. Uh, people say, well, it's not fair to the others. No one is charged with the crime that he's charged with. Mm -hmm. So it won't be three months, it could be a year or longer. He has been found to be a mental health concern. We ought to get him to a mental hospital and not to jail. See if they can restore his competency. But it was, uh, I regret the way it was handled, but uh, I did my job. And uh, I, quite frankly, I'm gonna work on that backlog. Mm -hmm. We need more forensic beds. We need some here in the Gulf Coast. He was ultimately gonna be taken to the Vernon on the Oklahoma border. You take these individuals one at a time, tremendous cost and time of uh, the sheriff's office. We're also reviewing that maybe these competency restoration conditions and treatment could be held in a local county jail. Well, you got a lot going on when yeah. you're out of session. I, I look do. forward to getting caught up with you before we go into the session, bring us up to date on what you're going to be doing right then, just before the session starts, okay? You got it. Thank you, Thank Senator. You. Thank Always you. good to see you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Just ahead, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month the awful numbers, and what can be done about it from the director of the Escape Family Resource Center. That's next when Houston Newsmakers continues. From KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. 
And welcome back to Houston Newsmakers. And good morning to Lydia Tsachi, the Chief Executive Officer of Escape Family Resource Center. We're going to focus on April, which is Child Abuse Prevention Month. For those who are tuning in and they don't know what Escape Family Resource Center does, remind them what Escape Family Resource Center folks. If you go to www.learntoparent.org, what you will see is uh, an organization that is dedicated to child abuse prevention and helping families raise confident children mm -hmm. who mind uh, their parents, parents who learn how to discipline children without ever resorting to violence, emotional abuse. It's, it's a fantastic organization that helps parents in any stressful situation learn the best skills how to preserve a peaceful home for now, children. In the month of April, what's your goal during this month in terms of trying to raise the kind of awareness you hope to raise? Well, absolutely. Every day is a child abuse prevention uh, day, right? Not, but in April, historically, we've given a lot more workshops. Please go to our website and, and see and really talk a little bit more about what it takes today in 21st century in 2016 to raise a child. Mm -hmm. How many um, uh, new skills there are to learn? How will we try to protect them from all kinds of obstacles that may stop them dampen their development, both academic and health-wise? I've been to LearnToParent.org. I think it's clearly one of the best websites in the world for what you do. And I, I noticed it talked about stress and how much stress is a factor in uh, almost any of abuse that you deal with. Is that correct? Absolutely. And that's the first thing that we actually discuss in programs with parents and with children because all our classes are for children 3 to 18 who study separately but concurrently. Indeed, when you think about stress, that's when the worst behavior comes out, especially if that's something that we witnessed in the past. So while we are in a regular you know, uh, situation and everything goes well, we can kind of uh, pull ourselves together and make rational decisions. But the minute we are stressed, it's much harder. You said something about children. Children are in classes as yes. well. Yes. So that, that almost went by me. How, what, what kind of well, things are children? Well, that's precisely what, what, what's unique about ESCAPE. It's not a regular place where you just send parents to learn for a couple of hours. All our curricula, and we have 11 various programs, uh, is uh, available to children, to children aged 3 to 18, and they're split according to their age, and parents study separately. So they study the same program, the same set of skills, but in their own or in vernacular. So in that way, everybody works together as a family. When they get started getting in those stressful situations which may get to trigger points, mm -hmm. they know how to handle each and Precisely. every Precisely, and also they learn how to speak with your heart, I statements, so instead of screaming and yelling, a, a parent can say, it really upsets me, and a child will say, which we hear it in our classrooms, Mom, use escape method. Mom, don't scream. Mom, there is a heart. So this is what we want to hear. When we talk about abuse, um, and it takes so many different forms. There's anatomy, you talk about physical, sexual, verbal. The worst is neglect. The wor 54 percent of all the calls that come to CPS are of neglect. Neglect, perpetual, consistent neglect of children's needs, everyday needs. That's the worst abuse? It's the worst abuse. It's the worst abuse. This whole process, how hopeful are you? I mean, I know you're always hopeful, but because you have to be for what you do. You have to be an eternal optimist yes. for ever anticipating the best possible Absolutely. outcome for this. What are your concerns and how hopeful are you that you can make a dent not only here locally but nationally in terms of reducing well, child abuse? Well, first of all, when we created LearnToParent.org, our new URL, we look at it as a new parenting wave. So. People learn about parenting not when there is a crisis, not when something happens and you are forced to go to a class, but look at it as, as part of your family development, as part of the mission. So changing parental attitudes about being a parent, this is something that I need to learn so I can have a, a family, confident family life where children, grandchildren, grandparents really know how to communicate without ever hurting a child. It should never hurt to be a child. So that kind of social change is our vision. And you can only do it when you start early. And that's what our uniqueness is. Can you learn from LearnToParent.org? how you can recognize signs of abuse? Absolutely. That's another thing that we do. We <clears throat> uh, teach Child Abuse Prevention 101 to professionals all over five counties, and we teach in classes how to recognize and what's your responsibility on reporting.
It's an amazing organization. It's always great to have you here. And as you said, although April is the month that everyone officially denotes it, you say every day really is Child Abuse Prevention Day. Absolutely. And, and loving a child and, and embracing and hugging and kissing no matter what. They are new to this world. It's our job to show them how to do it better. See, you know what? That's why I love having you on. I, I feel so positive about everything. You can feel positive, too. Go to this website. We've already said it's the best website known to mankind. Oh, thank you. I, <laughs> Learn I to parent dot org. Learn to parent dot org. That is the website. Uh, 713 9429500. Thank you. So uh, it, it, it's it's great for you to be able to say that cuz my eyes are bad. Lydia Sachi, thank you for coming. And in. thank you for being. Appreciate you. for uh, hopefully someone is being able to learn something and we can help somebody this morning. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Anytime. As always. Hey, coming up, we got jobs available in Houston. A look ahead how you may be able to land one next when Houston Newsmakers continues. A couple of things about this week and next. On last week's program, I said we'd have Houston Community College Chancellor Dr. Cesar Maldonado this week. A scheduled mix-up kept that from happening. I promise I'll have him and board chair Dr. Adrian Tamiz on in the near future. Next week, City Council Member Dwight Boykins will be here to talk about the upcoming Second Chance Job Fair. Last year, 1,200 people were served. We'll talk about the hopes for this year and who qualifies. That's next week here on Houston Newsmakers. Thank you to my guests. And if you'd like to see some of the previous shows or get information on today's program, go to click2houston.com and under the news banner, click on Newsmakers. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you back here again next week.